All right, Sam, welcome back, man. <laughs> Thanks for having me again. It's good to be back. So you've been on the podcast before, you've been featured in the profile videos with some ride-along videos, and this is going to be a, a reaction video to our ride-along video. Uh, but uh, before we do that, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge the fact that when you were here in Austin uh, back uh Gosh, a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago or so, something f fun happened. Your award. There, yeah. there it is. Tell us a little bit about th this night, this award. And uh, you actually knew that you were receiving this, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, People for Bikes had reached out a little bit ago, inviting me to an uh, ad advocacy conference they were having. And they were giving out the James Oberstar Award for Bicycle Excellence in Advocacy. Yep. And uh, I was one of the individuals that uh, w w won it. That was, yeah, it was pretty amazing. Go. Ex Excellence in Bicycle Advocacy, right there. Yeah, yeah. there it is. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was a, you know, you don't know how important an award is to the organization until yeah. you hold it. Yeah. And this award, I think, weighs something like 30 pounds. So <laughs> it is a very important award. Um, it's a solid piece of metal. <laughs> yeah. And also it's, you know, uh, you know, who, yeah. the, who is, the award is, is an incredibly important person for, yeah. Yeah. you know, what we do and for people for bikes. And, yeah. you know, he was the individual that started Safe Routes to School and got federal funding for it. And it's been an incredibly positive and impactful program for me personally. So to win an award in his name. Yeah. 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 Good stuff. And, and you and I haven't uh, seen each other on camera uh, since then. So congratulations on that. Thank you. <laughs> so let's get to the heart of the matter. We, we, we're not going to just talk about awards and that kind of stuff. We're going to talk about this uh, uh, little bike ride that we did. Now, this actually took place the very first morning that you arrived um, or after you arrived because you arrived late at night. And then you, you were like, yeah, I'm up for it. Let's go for a bike ride. And so I took you around to uh, a couple of different schools. And that's what we see here in the beginning phases. And then we went on a long bike ride along the Shoal Creek Trail, heading up to Shoal Creek Boulevard to look at some other protected bike lane infrastructure, as well as what I would prefer to call livability, uh, community livability enhancements. It's not just about the bike lane. It's about everything coming together. It's, it's traffic calming, bringing the speeds and volumes down, making it safer for pedestrians to be able to cross, as well as making it safer and more inviting for people to get around by bike. Uh, so I'll shut up and press play. And, and uh, we can talk a little bit about uh, your, your, your thoughts, because this is literally just, you know, a few blocks away from my house. House, and, and then we show up at the school. And what were what were your first impressions as we uh, sort of rolled up on this? I think I was just sort of in awe. I've always wondered, you know, what it would be like to have a protected bike lane, you know, that extends a long distance in both directions, you know, by a school and its impacts. So to see it, well, I was just very excited. Yeah. I'm a big fan of you know quick build, yeah. and so just seeing you know the ballers going up and the sort of like cones, the domes out there um, was just really exciting to see. I was very skeptical about riding around in Austin and I was incredibly impressed with all that they've done. Yeah. Yeah. And we can talk more globally about uh, what you saw later in your trip, because you two days later, you ended up going on a, a more significant bike ride. But we paused right here for a specific reason. If you look behind you, you see that uh, that there's no curb cut there. So this is where there were no ADA accessible uh, uh, ramps for the sidewalks. And so this is still an area that needs a lot of work and transformation that needs to happen. And you made the very astute point that, you know, so for somebody who's in a wheelchair, they're not going to find it very accessible to be on the sidewalk. They're actually going to have a better go of it being in the actual uh, protected bike lane. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah. So that's why we stopped here as I was panning and, and showing you that. And now we're on the backside of the school exactly. uh, because you had asked, well, where are the parents dropping off? And here's this walk, this safe, uh, safe routes to school sign there. And then we found, find where the actual uh, parent drop off area is because it had been removed away from where the protected bikeways were. So, right. I remember that hill going down this hill. <laughs> we were screaming. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Do you remember what you said right as we were pulling up to here? I'm glad we don't have to go up it. <laughs> <laughs> you were actually exclaiming you're going, wait, no way. Another protected bikeway <laughs> out of school? Yes, yeah. Sam, another one. <laughs> you're a great tour guide. You knew you know what I like, the type of contact content I like. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, no, no, you're, you're, you're quite welcome. And, uh, and we talk a little bit more extensively about this particular uh, infrastructure because this one went in relatively recently. You see much more robust concrete work being done. We also see this little, you know, kind of trade-off that had to take place uh, in this particular area to accommodate that right turn only lane uh, going into the, their parking lot. Uh, and so we talked a little bit about that. Uh, you've had some time to, to let the dust kind of settle and let some stuff sink in. Uh, any, any further observations about this installation? Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, that sort of right turn lane, it still creates that inviting for parents to drive and drop their kids off at the front door of the school. But, you know, I'm sure at the time the planners, you know, needed to make that trade off. I think it's just hopefully over time, you know, school administrators and school departments sort of understand that promoting walking and biking should be the top priority. And even those little trade offs that make it easy can deter families to choose uh, walking or biking to school. Yeah. Yeah. And what we've done here, I pressed pause for just a second so you could get your first glimpse at one of our Dutch inspired protected intersections with the bike infrastructure here. And uh, you would ask the question, well, how do the kids, you know, sort of get in from the neighborhoods? And so this is part of that cycle network. And so it's the, the intersection of two separate uh, protected bikeways coming together. On this side, it's a two-way cycle track. And then on the other road the, the, that is perpendicular here, it's a protected bikeway on either side of, of the street. Uh, it just blows my mind watching this. I'm like, what, you know, the, you know, Austin must have different type of money available to spend on this or really uh, well-staffed, you know, transportation departments uh, to be able to pull stuff like this off. It's really impressive. Well, I mean, that's that's a good point. I mean, it does take money to do this kind of stuff. And essentially, the Austin voters have agreed to tax themselves to fund all ages and abilities, a high comfort network, the build out of a system. So, you know, absolutely. That's a big part of it is you have to be able to, you know, build it now. It, it's it's still I mean, even when you have the money, it still takes a tremendous amount of manpower you know, of, of being able to, you know, put this together. Um, let me say that a, a, in a different way. It, even after you have the money, it still takes a tremendous amount of staff time to be able to plan this stuff out and get it installed and, and then still deal with, you know, the cultural stuff. We just rolled past a, a you know, a truck blocking the bike lane. This is a brand new bike lane. And some of the members of, of the community are resisting it. They don't want it there. And so it, it takes time to, to do this. And it's very, very time intensive for sure. Absolutely. But you do it. They do it very well. The city of Austin, you know, like doing these intersections are not. It doesn't feel like they're, you know, being cheap about it. It feels like they're, you know, putting good uh, investment into it. 
Yeah. And in certain circumstances, you're, you're doing it lighter, quicker, cheaper using the uh, flexible posts and lo- using the lighter materials. And then in other times where you know you're going to have to roll out the concrete crew to do things like uh, building those ADA accessible ramps, uh, you, you might as well go ahead and plan on, you know, putting the concrete down, you know, in that particular intersection. There's uh, obviously other, you know, factors involved as well, but this is a great example of how you can do things uh, relatively quickly and have some significant and legitimate, you know, protection in a facility that can go down relatively quickly, uh, assuming you've got all the the planning in the works. And, And of course, you've gone through all the open houses. (laughs) <laughs> and all of the community engagement because changes to the streetscape become very, very fear inducing for many people. Um, and oftentimes, especially the elderly, because they've been used to uh, driving in a neighborhood that has been, you know, you know, designed in a specific way and, and they get used to driving uh, that environment. And so they tend to come to the, the open houses and be very concerned about those changes. Absolutely. I was going to say, when we're back at the school, it'd be interesting if the school could do a map of the students and the catchment and what, you know, like two blocks from that protected bike lane, what percentage of students, you know, live by it. It'd be very interesting to see. Yeah. Well, and you and I made the comment too, um, uh, as we were riding that it's one thing to put the hardware down and have access to these types of facilities and trails. Uh, and then you still have to be able to, uh, counter the culture of doing things a certain way. You still have to have that uh, activation and the incentives and, and things of that nature. Now, w- you and I were joking while we were in this particular area, because this is the hotel where you were staying at. Right. And I was I was pointing out to you as we were down on the trail that, yeah, you're right here. That's how close your all ages and abilities uh, facility was to be able to get up into that neighborhood is it was literally right out the door (laughs) and across the street for you. Yeah, it's watching it again. It's what I thought found really interesting was like all the different styles of paths and trails and, you know, some were gravel, some were paved, some were, you know, straight, some were windy. It was, it was just cool to see how Austin sort of connected these pieces of infrastructure together. Yeah. Well, and I'm glad you pointed that out too, because, you know, on that particular um, route that we just did, you know, we tr- you know, crossed over facilities that were managed, designed and managed and operated by three different majorly different departments within the city. We had, you know, the transportation department, the Department of Public Works that does the the paved urban trails. And then we also had Parks and Rec. All of them had, you know, different uh, responsibilities on that route that we just took. So you have to get them all working together. (laughs) Yeah, it's one team. Yeah, exactly. Well, and that's that's a good point, too, is from the perspective of the, you know, the the community, when they look at things that, you know, they just kind of go, this is just the city. And so they just think of it as all one amorphous thing, the city, and they don't have necessarily have, nor should they have that level of appreciation that it's actually multiple different departments and jurisdictions and responsibilities. Uh, they just think of it all as the city. So, um, I, I reversed it real quick just to point out that we're talking about this brand new protected bike lane right in front of the hotel that you were staying in. And as I mentioned, it was a new hotel. And so when they built the hotel, uh, they worked with the city to make sure that they did the concrete work necessary to put in the protected bikeway. And it's the first leg of what we see here, which is going to be the protected intersection at Riverside and Lamar. And Lamar is, is a big, ugly, strody type of facility now, but it will eventually have, as you can see on this, this diagram here, uh, two-way cycle tracks on both sides of that massive road. 
I walk down it to get to your house and having that two way cycle track uh, will be very appreciated. Yeah. yeah. I think that's something that was talked about in our, um, in our other ride that we did. One of the planners, you know, they really have it dialed in working with the developers to put in, you know, high quality bike infrastructure when they are, you know, redoing the curbs and all of, you know, the stuff that goes on. Right. You know, I feel like that is a very missed opportunity that is not happening in Portland. Yeah. Well, and one thing that, that Portland has done well over the years is, is stuff like this, is making sure that you get in those critical bridges that need to be built. And, and so that's what this represents. This is a bridge. This is a bike and pedestrian bridge that gets us over Lady Bird Lake, which is also uh, basically uh, the Colorado River that has been dammed up in two locations not the Colorado River <laughs> with the, the Grand Canyon, but our Colorado River. And then it also, we have this additional flyover that was built later after the spiral was built um, to get us over, again, one of these strode-like major arterials in, in the form of Cesar Chavez. And you and I didn't get a chance to ride on it. You m- might have done a little bit of ride uh, later in the week. But the the paved you see to the left of, of where these cars are, that is the Crosstown Bikeway or originally named the Lance Armstrong Bikeway. And so that's another really critical piece of infrastructure in terms of a separated cycle network, uh, a cycle, you know, two-way cycle track or cycle path. It's good stuff. And then we fly over and get to uh, where we have our breakfast. Yummy. Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, this was, again, the first part of of our ride. And and this represented, you know, part one of our two-part series from our video. Before we dive into the second half here, any final thoughts or observations on, you know, seeing this for that second time or third time now, that those, those first two schools and then, you know, making our way on the, uh, the pathway to the hotel? Yeah, I think I'm, you know, I'm just like really impressed again about these protected bike lanes and how they were able to put them in and just, there was just not a lot of cars parked on those streets. So, you know, I sort of, you know, I'm like comparing, I'm like, what street is this like in Portland? And it sort of feels like it's kind of any street, but it's just a very, uh, maybe it's just a Austin way, you know, like the way the city of Austin is designed, maybe a little more sprawl than it is in Portland or something. But I don't know. I'm just generally like very impressed Well, you could tell, too, by the distances that we were in a very close proximity neighborhood to the downtown area. I mean, it's literally a a five minute bike ride from where we were at to this area right here in the downtown. So very, very close proximity. So you could probably do the same thing in Portland and say, well, you know, from the river, you know, if I ride this direction in five, 10, 15 minutes, what do those neighborhoods kind of look like? It's kind of a similar type of thing. You know, we were riding through neighborhoods that were platted probably back in the 1920s. Um, On my block, the houses were built in the 1940s. So these are very close in suburban, quote unquote, neighborhoods. These are first ring suburbs, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. Now, we're on a, uh, a creek in piece of infrastructure, a riparian corridor, the Shoal Creek Trail. We're heading north, making our way up to the Shoal Creek Boulevard. And I wanted to show you this because this is, this is really important. This is some of the newer infrastructure. This was wider. And then you'll very quickly see some of the older stuff that is, is quite narrow. Now, the reason why this is newer around this corner is because a flash flood ripped out all the old stuff. (laughs) So it had to get rebuilt. And so it did get rebuilt and, uh, and it opened up about five years ago. And then now we're riding on some of the narrower stuff that it needs to be replaced, you know, in, in time when, when the funds become available and, uh, and we can do that. But 
it, it still serves a critical role for connectivity. And, and we end up seeing just a steady stream of people either walking or biking uh, along these stretches because you'll be able to see when we pop out, we're still right in the downtown area. Yeah, again, the very, you know, variations of different types of trails was really fun to be able to do in such a short period of time. Yeah, yeah. Now, you had the opportunity to to ride on, you know, other types of facilities. Looking back at this, you know, how how does the other stuff that you were able to, um, you know, ride on and, and, and compare? you know, comparing, you know, what we're seeing here today in, you know, so far on this video to some of the other stuff that you were exploring. I, yeah, we went, um, we were talking earlier about the bike path, multi-use path by the MLK station. Mm -hmm. I was just really impressed that, you know, that sort of biking experience also very close in to the city, right. where like people's backyards had, this off trail uh, path. And I just, you know, that's something that I experience when I'm in uh, Sun River, Oregon. Okay. Sort of like trail network that's like right by people's houses. Right. Uh, but to see it in Austin was really cool. Yeah. What we should do is uh, maybe even play a little bit of that as well. We can do that in, in, in a little bit and uh, we can, you know, get a sense as to what that that particular area is because I th I'm I'm with you. I think that that's a an extraordinary environment there, and that trail that you were on is called the Boggy Creek Trail, and again a key connector to a major transit stop uh, on our light rail system. It's not really a light rail system on our transit rail system, and you can see we're just you know continuing to to make our way up north, and again you know we're down below, and then we'll pop back up, and we whenever we pop back up or back up along that busy Lamar Boulevard that you had, you know, walked along earlier in the day. Now you're on the north section of Lamar Boulevard. And you can kind of get a sense that, you know, yeah, that's, these are fast moving cars. In, in certain parts of this, we're on what would be considered a, um, a wide sidewalk. And then sometimes we're up on a narrower sidewalk simply because, that's all that, that we have access to. Now, over this bridge, we turn right and we get back onto a uh, an unpaved, so natural surface trail, which would then also be uh, managed by the park service or the park depart parks department. And I think you made the comment uh, uh, somewhere along the lines of like, oh, this is really pleasant. <laughs> yeah, it was a really fun ride. All right. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. I was also amazed at how many people were out. Yeah, well, it was a beautiful day. <laughs> yeah, it's a very active city. Yeah, yeah. Well, in, in fact, you know, it's it's an active town. That's that's one of the reasons why I ended up being there, is because uh, it, it, it's a place where um, you know there is that culture of activity, and so it, it kept popping up on my radar screen. And so I went out of my way to make sure that I visited Austin after I presented at a conference in San Antonio way back in 2014. Uh, it was the uh, Health in the Built Environment uh, Conference. And I was presenting with uh, Chuck Marone from Strong Towns. And uh, we, we were like, okay, I got to you know, check out Austin. Everybody keeps saying it is an amazing place. It's an active town. Uh, there's a strong culture of activity there. So that's what I did. I checked it out. One thing led to another and ended up moving there. <laughs> so what we're going to come up to here, as you'll, as you'll probably recall, is that there is a, a landslide. And so normally, back in the olden days, we'd stay on this side of the creek. We would continue heading uh, northbound in, in this direction. Uh, but with, because that landslide that happened, um, I think there was two of them, one in 2018 and one in 2019, it completely obliterated the, the trail. So we actually have to take a, a hard left here and then get up onto a detour up onto the sidewalk uh, to be able to get past that blockage. And I think this is where we're, we're like, woo, <laughs> somebody made the comment on our original uh, premiere of this video that it felt like we were uh, sort of teetering on the side of the, the cars. Yeah. 
Yes, it's a little narrow. It is kind of fun watching this, like, you know, like from like where your camera was, you know, where you're holding mm-hmm. it. It's, you know, very like first player sort of experiencing the bike ride. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I call these ride along videos because I'm, yeah, that's just it. We're sort of like inviting you to come along for the ride in the case where I'm also interviewing somebody like I, I was with you. I'm frequently, uh, panning over and putting you on camera and, and, and talking. I've edited most of those segments out of this particular video for us to do for, for a reaction. But yeah, I mean, it's kind of a neat, it's a neat little, uh, perspective you know, a a quote unquote, a writer's point of view or POV. It's it's a good way to get a a real appreciation for the the infrastructure. And what we're panning on here is a segment of newer pathway that was on this side of the creek. And so that was the comment that you made is like, oh, we're on this side of the creek now. And then this is the new signage and wayfinding signage that has been uh, installed by the uh, the Parks and Rec Department. And I believe that might have also been uh, partially funded by the Shoal Creek Conservancy or maybe completely funded by them. I'm not sure. I'll have to go back and ask them. But now we're on, again, um, an alternate route um, on this side of the creek because of that landslide. And if you just look to the left, you can probably see some of the damage over there. I don't think I panned the camera there because we had a, a, you know, some pedestrians in front of us here. So I was trying to pay attention. Comments a little bit about the fact that, you know, we're on bikes, you know, I'm, I'm on, uh, on my normal acoustic bike and you're on my, um, my large GSD electric assist bike. And we're sharing space, you know, with lots and lots of other trail users, path users. How did it feel for you? It, was it seemed pretty uh pleasant it didn't seem like there was really any times that we you know sort of like had to stop or you know we were able to ride side by side or be able to talk pretty much the whole time and i didn't get the sense that there was any anxiety or anxiousness you know from any of the other trail users because we were on bikes and they might have been walking their dogs or anything like that in fact we we ended up chatting with, you know, several people with doggies. That's, you know, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think we were going at like a very, you know, casual pace. Yeah. And you can see that that is actually uh, one of the parks and rec trucks um, doing garbage collection, I believe. Great example of how uh, parks and rec department could probably do us all a little bit of a favor if they had smaller equipment. (laughs) Not the big trucks. But this is a good example here. This segment, um, that that section where we were on the downhill there, is really, really rough. And so there's areas on this trail where you can tell that, yeah, it's, it's a good decade plus past its prime and needs to be redone. But we also have segments where it's natural surface trail and then transitions into uh, concrete and sometimes into asphalt um, where it needs to be. Yeah, it it definitely was not like so bad that, you know, you'd have to like get off and walk or there's just continuous potholes that you're, you know, it's like really hard to navigate. So it's definitely in need of improvements and updates, but it's, uh, you know, still enjoyable to ride. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, now there was a segment that was really rough, but we didn't film that. (laughs) <laughs> you remember that one right yeah yeah we were that was on our way back we we that took was our, the, uh, that was the mountain biking you know yeah well it's it's a really neat feature because it's it's a feature where you you are when you're riding your bike you're literally ducking all the way down about as low as your your handlebars um the overhang because it, it almost feels like you're riding through a cave And again, another, another bit of uh, improvement areas here. This is relatively new infrastructure that has been built. And again, transitioning into the, the older stuff and, and the narrowness here. And again, this is a detour for what we were just talking about, the very, very rough trail surface uh, that's down below and to the left of this. 
Now we're about ready to um, get on to uh, another special segment here. And uh, this is going to be rolling past the private school and the, the pilot project. So I know you have a lot to talk about or a lot of observations on this because, uh, you know, this is, this is fun. I mean, this is one of those things that we sometimes have to do to move projects forward. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of pilot projects, giving them a try, seeing how it is, especially around schools. Yeah. Do you have any any similar types of pilot projects uh, in your area? No, I mean, we have a pilot diverter that uh, on one of our neighborhood greenways. So mm-hmm. they're doing a one year pilot of it. Okay. Um, okay. But something like directly by a school. No, I can't think of anything right now. Yeah. I'd love yeah. to see, you know, districts, you know, transportation departments and school districts working together to pilot different types of infrastructure improvements, yeah. you know, to be able to more directly meet the needs that parents have who want to walk and bike their kids to school. Yeah. And so what I was telling you when we were at that intersection there was put your school hat on. We're going to be rolling past the school. And, uh, and, and this is the, that pilot project installation where it's also considered, it's not considered a piece of bicycle infrastructure. It's really considered an extension of the trail. So the trail conservancy, the Shoal Creek Trail Conservancy is very much a part of, of this as well, because they, this is a critical missing link in the trail. And so you commonly will see people walking and biking um, and other trail users because this will connect you to that, you know, that next segment of the trail. So this is the missing link that just happens, so happens to be past this school. Yeah. And this is, uh, you know, infrastructure that's going to be used by people all the time, not just during the school year. So, you know, kudos to City of Austin for sticking to this and, you know, doing the pilot and not sort of catering to the, you know, people who want to drive and uh, drop their kids off. And, you know, for them, for their convenience as, you know, what is most important versus the greater good of the community. Right. Yeah. And you can see that there is still parking available. It's just not on mm. both sides of the street as it was prior. So, you know, it, it's still there. Things are tight. And it just, it requires that the the two-way traffic of motor vehicle traffic just needs to proceed with caution, slow down. That's something I really have been impressed with, with the diverter pilot that went in uh, like a couple of months ago is... yeah the difference in uh, drivers that we interact with on the bike bus now, um, you can just sense that their local traffic, that's sort of like the hierarchy of cars to people biking has changed and drivers understand because I think they're more local drivers. They understand that like this is a neighborhood and this isn't just for cutting through. And it's just amazing. I mean, it's like 12 bollards. You know, it's like very inexpensive infrastructure to put in, um, but the impacts can be really tremendous. Yeah. And that's exactly what we we would expect to see, right? I mean, you wouldn't expect to see um, aggressive, quote unquote, rude behavior from somebody who like literally lives on that street. I mean, it certainly can happen, but it's less likely to happen than somebody who is coming in from you know, somewhere else and using that as a rat run. Absolutely. And they might, you know, might be in a rush that morning, but they also know that, you know, the bike bus comes through on the street and it's, you know, the city's preferred walking and biking network and safe routes to the school network. So we need to prioritize kids. Right. So, Real quickly, uh, for anybody who is is wondering what a bike bus is, maybe they're tuning in. This is the first time they've they've heard of it. Um, what is a bike yeah. bus? A uh, bike bus is an organized bike ride to school uh, with designated meeting times, and students and uh, volunteers, parents, teachers 
will ride bikes to school. And if you live along the route or you go along the route, when the bike bus comes by, you just find a gap and start riding. It's a lot of fun. The kids really thrive. It's just so joyful. So it's been a big success at our school. Right. And, you know, that's kind of what has brought you to the attention of, of many folks. Um, talk a little bit about that. Cause you know, you and I, before we hit the record button today, you're just like, you know, pinching yourself going, what the heck has happened? <laughs> yeah, I got a, my life has been very crazy the past six, eight months approaching a year now. Um, I got to like, I get Twitter messages. Someone messaged me yesterday that they're starting a bike bus in Anchorage, Alaska. You know, I get messages from an individual in India who, you know, is starting a bike bus there. I mean, it's for, uh, for whatever reason, I've become one of the faces of the bike bus movement. And it's been a really exciting, really positive, also uh, very overwhelming and a very humbling experience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, it's kind of funny. And in, in one of the videos, uh, you talk about the fact that you you originally thought that you'd be known as the 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 walking school bus person, and but then the the bike bus really just took off. Yeah, absolutely. I've always done walking school buses when I was in Boston and at my previous school in Portland. But uh, last school year, I saw a viral video of a bike the BC bus in Barcelona. And then there was bike buses in San Francisco and Hood River, Oregon. And so I got inspired to try it out at my new school and uh, we did it on Earth Day. And so it's, the first one we did was 75 kids, which was over 10% of the school. Uh, and so we kept doing it for the rest of the school year. And then in October, the following school year, we hit a third of the kids, 190 kids biking. Um, and that's when all the viralness and making national news, Kelly Clarkson show, Access Hollywood, the bike bus was mentioned on Saturday Night Live. Um, so people just love the joy that the bike bus brings, seeing you know that joy and freedom uh, that children are deserving and also that bikes provide for kids and everybody. People love being on bicycles and just having that freedom. So being able to create that space for the kids has been really something special. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to pause it here uh, for just a second. You know, we're now in this far northern uh, suburb of the Shoal Creek Boulevard here. And uh, the context is a little different. It feels just a little bit different, but the, the spirit of the installation is the same in that it's really not about the bikes. It's about making the entire environment more livable. And so we see the pedestrian crossing here is a key feature to this. We also see along the way here uh, another key feature, which ends up being a, um, a rain garden installation after we depaved and removed a, um, a slip lane, a, a motor vehicle slip lane, which, you know, previously were slingshotting, you know, cars around a, a, a bend and a corner. And so it, I, we, we talk about this in the video is that um, it's important for us as advocates and for cities to frame these projects in a way that really looks at the overall benefits of the projects. It's not about the bikes and it's not about the bike lanes. It's really about that overall concept of livability and creating a place that's truly more people oriented and more sustainable too, and just safer and more inviting for everybody. Yeah, you, I think are really doing a good job. I was taking notes during our ride about how to communicate about these lanes differently. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it, and it, it, I think we do ourselves a disservice as advocates when we lean too heavily into, oh, this is bike infrastructure. This is a bike lane project. Da, 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 da. Well, yeah, I mean, that's one feature of it, but really this is traffic calming and this is, you know, livability enhancements. These, you know, really, you know, there's so many other 
broader and deeper benefits to the overall society and the overall community than just a bike lane. So I know I feel like we need to bring runners into this. I feel I'm always seeing runners running in the street and I'm not a runner. So there must be some, you know, preferred conditions about running in the street versus running on the sidewalk. Yeah, it's it's a lot safer. If we just watch the sidewalk for a little while here, you'll notice that there's all sorts of dips, there's all sorts of breaks in it, and, and it's not consistent. So yeah, it's that consistency. It's much easier uh, and safer, less likelihood of tripping and falling uh, if you're running, you know, in in a lane, in a, in a multi-use lane or a, in a bike lane like this. So yeah, you'll, you'll frequently see that happen when you have protected infrastructure like this is, you know, folks will jump in and start running in it. And this is our turnaround. That was it. This is it. (laughs) So you, you, you now had a chance to, to see that again, that, that section of it. When you compare the first section, you know, of our ride in those older neighborhoods, and then you look at this again, the second half, uh, any, any comparisons or any contrast that you have when you, when you look at those two different types? No, I just, I like how consistent that, you know, um, Austin has been with the styles of their bike lanes, you know, Mm -hmm. It seems like you take what you can get, but when they can do a, you know, a cycle track, you know, both bike lanes on the same side, they're just like keeping with the same style, which I think really helps for drivers and for people biking. They know how to navigate it because it's consistent. You know, a lot of times drivers are like, I don't want that in. I don't know how to navigate it um, because it's new or it's different than what was done previously. And so we're like constantly setting drivers up to be frustrated where I feel like Austin's done a nice job of being consistent with it. Yeah. And it it very much is Dutch inspired. I mean, you really see it in those, in those intersections where we use that concrete and we have true protection in, in those intersections when they have the ability to go through and, and, you know, not just settle on only doing the lighter, quicker, cheaper, they're putting the the concrete in. And then when they do the concrete, um, they actually mix that red pigment into the actual concrete slurry so that, uh, that's not paint folks. That's, that's literally, you know, pigment in the, 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 the concrete mix itself. And so if anything, it might fade a little bit over the years, that top layer of it, but it's not going to flake away. It's not slippery. Um, it's very much a part of it. And that's part of the consistency that we also see with the, the bike network, um, in the, the downtown area. So this is down by the, um, the convention center, and this is our rail transit area here. And then this is going to go underneath um, I-35 and get into the uh, the east side, and then eventually make its way up to uh, the Boggy Creek Trail. So we're, we'll we'll take a look at that. Um, did you have a chance to spend much time in in this area? Uh, we did bike this. We biked it the other way. Um, uh-huh. But besides that, I didn't spend any other time. Yeah. What's fascinating about this is it's all part, this is the downtown network. I mean, this this literally will connect directly to that uh, Fluger bike and pedestrian bridge that connects you directly to your hotel. You know, that, that's the, the yeah. level of, of connectivity and cohesiveness of the, the network. And so now... Uh, you can see that you could have a kid who could literally ride from the elementary school up, you know, at Barton Hills Elementary, you know, all the way down through here, through the downtown area, underneath the the I-35, uh, you know, freeway, which we're about ready to go under and make their way all the way into the east side and go up and, and uh, go to that. Uh, Is this I-35 right here? Yeah, this is I-35. We uh, just rolled right through I-35. Very nice. And it, and it just happened that, uh, you know, when I was rolling through there, that there was a break in traffic. So I was able to roll right through here. I did have to pause just a little bit, but again, absolutely no traffic control there. I didn't have to wait for anything. I just waited until it was a safe to, to move through. And then I did. 
And this is all housing here. So that's something that is important to note is that we've got uh, a Target and a Whole Foods on the first floor of this building here and then residential all above. And so this is all housing that is so close to downtown that they can literally walk to downtown or jump on a scooter or ride their bike and protected infrastructure. And I think that this is just, you know, one of the, the main visions that the city has for the future is, is looking at, you know, Hey, this is one way that we can encourage more people to ride, make this more normal, uh, for, for the, for the population, for, you know, people who are obviously you're within easy biking, walking and biking distance, you're much more likely to do it. And that's a little pedestrianized plaza between those two buildings right there. Actually, this is the, the, the Boggy Creek Trail. So um, as we turn the corner and head towards the, the, the right here, Sam, um, we're going to have the, the, the rail line is going to be off to our left. And then we're going to be following the, that transit line, the rail line, all the way up to the MLK station, which is what you were talking about. And you, it's, it's worth kind of pointing out here once again that we're going over a multitude of different trail types. We're again on a natural surface trail right here, but then we're going to get to, so this would be parks department, the parks and rec department, uh, you know, it, their responsibility is over the unpaved trails. And then when we transition over to the paved trails, then we're on what is considered the, um, the parks, or excuse me, the public works urban trails program. And so those are the paved trail system. Keeping, keeping things fun and interesting. <laughs> but your, your yeah, point just, that you were, you were making earlier is that, you know, as we go around the corner here, this, this trail system is literally right here, you know, in, in the backyards of many of these, these residences. And yet we have this level of connectivity all the way down to downtown, as well as that critical transit stop. Yeah. I think why I love it so much is as a parent who has had a really hard time getting my kids to ride bikes, um, having these like car free spaces really removes a lot of the stress that you might already, you know, be experiencing when trying to instruct your kid to, uh, you know, ride. Right. And so it's just nice to have these spaces that are car free where you can just let the kid wobble, go to, you know, go to the right, go to the left, and they're not going to end up in the street. Yeah. Um, so this is really something that I, I wish we had in our neighborhood. Yeah. And you probably noticed right there is we made that transition off of that, that natural surface trail. Now we're on something very, very unique for Austin. I think this is the first time that they had done this where they have both a pedestrian uh, path to the left and then they have the, um, the, the cycle path, the two-way cycle track, um, and they come together over this bridge, but then they split back again. And so you have separate space in, in this particular environment. And again, off to the right, we had some ball fields and then we also have lots and lots of houses. And what's really critical about these houses here is they're all connected to this trail system. So you'll notice as we pass these trees, you'll notice the trail connectivity and the sidewalk connectivity to this particular uh, trail system. And if you look to the left there, that's the, the transit line. That's the, the rail. And I think this is the image that you remember. Yeah, this, yeah exactly. Yeah, there was a group that was, it was like students with special needs riding recumbent bikes through here. Yeah, yeah. It was, yeah. Yeah, we have uh, a program that really helps out with, uh, you know, getting students with special needs um, out on bikes, on recumbent bikes. And there's also uh, the Golden Rollers program, which gets uh, elderly uh, onto adult trikes and, and get them out uh, on the, the trail system. And they actually operate right off of this trail network. And here is part of that connectivity to the, the community there. 
but we don't have to watch the whole thing on this, Sam. Yeah. I just wanted to, sh- I wanted to bring it. this back to you because you, you were, you were super excited about this and, uh, and, and you, you, you said, is there any chance that we could play that? I'm like, oh, heck yeah, we could do that. <laughs> now, the other thing that you didn't get to see, um, is, is Miller, you know, the, the Mueller district. And you had said, yeah, yeah there, somebody was telling us that there was like this airport or whatever that, you know, got redone and like, oh yeah, totally. That, that is, that is one of the, uh, I think the, the most exciting, uh, developments that has taken place in, um, in Austin over the years. And, um, and yeah, it, it is exactly that. It is the old, um, municipal airport. It was our airport before it got relocated, um, out to, um, Bergstrom, Austin Bergstrom airport, which used to be an air force base. So this one used to be our, our, our normal real commercial air, airport. Um, and then it got turned into a development and what did we do? Well, we built in this, <laughs> So more Dutch inspired uh, cycle networks. And so this is a, uh, a new community that was built and built with Dutch standards of, uh, you know, cycle tracks and pathways. And it's just really extraordinary. That particular, um, f- that particular facility goes right to what was our very first ever um, uh, protected uh, intersection. Our very first protected intersection in the entire state was in this development. It was built a few years ago. And uh, it, it, what was funny about it is it was built before the houses were built. Oh, wow. Because it was, yeah, because it was all runway previously. So <laughs> it was like, oh, okay, cool. Um, and so, but what the reason why I want to show you this is that very first protected a bikeway intersection is right in front of the new middle school that is opening coming up this next year. And so all the kids in the neighborhood here um, are going to have access to this. So this is the protected bikeway. This intersects with this other two-way protected bikeway. This is the first protected intersection, bike intersection uh, in Texas. And right behind Preston Tyree here, you can see the construction barrier there. That's where the uh, the new middle school is being built. And so all these kids are going to grow up going to this middle school and they have protected bikeways uh, leading them to this middle school. And you had commented on that. You were like, this is extraordinary. All these schools with protected infrastructure leading right up to the doorstep. Yeah, it would make it... Uh you're removing a lot of the barriers. Yeah. So infrastructure is one thing, Sam, but you and I both know that it takes more than infrastructure to get people to ride. So to close this out, talk a little bit about what cities can do other than this, building the, the high quality, you know, high comfort, all ages and abilities facilities. What else needs to be done to help encourage more people to ride more often, specifically kids yeah i think um providing opportunities for kids to ride bicycles if they you know need education working you know in with the school uh is a great way to do it Uh, i would also say you know creating and supporting and funding initiatives like the bike bus or walking school buses to really help students and families scaffold those skills to be able to walk or ride their bikes to school is really important. And I think anything we can do to support families to not, uh, you know, have to take on the burden all on themselves of student transportation can really be impactful. Yeah. What's the approximate, you know, sort of age range when you kind of expect that they're going to feel confident enough to, to be able to do it and maybe have that intellectual capacity and learning to be able to, to handle uh, the realities out on the, the roadways? Yeah, I'd say kids biking without parents is probably fourth, but mostly fifth graders that are doing that. Okay. You know, I'd sort of, I, you know, would highly recommend if you're feeling confident or if a kid feels confident, um, 
you know, if you're doing the bike bus, I sort of say like drop your kid off and then you can go bike to the, you know, the parent bikes to the school while the younger kid will bike with the bike bus. And I think that's a nice way to scaffold independence. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, also just sort of organizing smaller groups. So, you know, if you have a second grader, if there's a couple other, you know, like making a smaller group and maybe one parent just rides with them, right? that can just be a nice way of scaffolding it. But I think, you know, it has to start somewhere. So even if you rode with your kid and then the last block to school, if you felt like it was safe, you just, you know, let them go and ride. It's, you know, it starts with one block and you build from there. Right. It seems like too, um, you know, sort of building off of the success of the bike bus is creating an environment where, uh, on the non bike bus days that, you know, maybe some of the older, more confident, more competent riders of kids could help mentor some of their, their peers and maybe some of their, the, the, the younger kids and bring them, you know, kind of bring them along. Yeah. There's, um, in Japan, uh, there was a 99% invisible episode about walking school buses and, it's from what it sounds like the school sort of helped facilitate that with the older mm-hmm. students. So, you know, it's wa- there it's walking, but it could also be biking where, you know, you sort of help the students and then connect with other families with younger kids to walk together as a group. And I think that would be a nice way. And I think the schools is kind of the perfect place to do it because you know, we have relationships with the students, we have access to their information. So we know where kids live, we know how to message. And I think there's a lot of opportunities for that. But I do need to talk to my fifth graders and fourth graders and say like, hey, like, you know, you can ride bikes to school, not just on bike bus days, but I think, you know, and maybe I need to like do a little incentive to just give that little motivation. I would imagine you've got, I know that you have a few that, you know, have taken upon themselves to, to do it themselves. And so I would imagine that that, you know, catches the attention of some of them. And I was like, oh, you mean I can do this on a non-Wednesday? So. Yeah, I, I definitely need to like do some surveying of the students and families because there's a big difference more. I was kind of hoping for more students that mm-hmm. would ride bikes on non-bike bus days. I guess we'll see when the weather gets better. Right. But, you know, what is that delta? Why is there a big difference? And what can we do to, you know, improve numbers on bike bus day, or on non-bike bus days? Right. Well, and I think this, this kind of reinforces what we were just talking about, which is it's one thing to have the infrastructure, but you have to also have the engagement activities and the the programming and the, and, you know, sort of that um, initiative, that energy that goes into, as you're using the, the term scaffolding, you know, kind of encouraging and building that base so that you can, you know, get that habit happening. Because once that habit starts happening, you probably saw this with your walking school buses over the years, is that once that habit gets going, I mean, that's that's what they start craving. You know, it's not just a once a week thing. They they want to do it all the time. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Sam, thank you so very much. This has been fun. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed uh, going back down yeah, memory lane. Yeah, this was great. It was really fun to go back over these videos and... Uh, you know, just experience that awesome trip to Austin. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this ride along video with coach Sam Balto of Portland, Oregon and bike bus fame. Uh, And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, (laughs) leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, again, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just hit that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell uh, so that you can customize your notification preferences. Uh, I'll be back soon with another video. So until then, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.